part number three of Israel's family enemies. And uh, again, one of the reasons that we uh, are doing this is a result of the question. Why are things happening the way that they're happening over there? Why can't uh, they get along? The fact of the matter is they can't because it's built in genetically and it's part of their family heritage. Uh, and um, we saw this going all the way back to where the world started its repopulation at the point of Noah, the foundation, uh, the one upon whom the rest of humanity uh, is, uh, is uh, its source. So we went, though, in removing Japheth. Now, the reason that we do this is because of the order there. Actually, it's Japheth, Ham, and Shem. But uh, it's uh, switched where you have uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and most of the listings and so forth simply because the real conflict is among Shem and Ham. The Hamitic line was doubly cursed. The Semitic line is doubly blessed. Uh, and uh, we looked here at uh, their various sons because for some reason, and the reason, of course, is simply this. God is picking certain ones even out of the cursed and blessed lines to focus in on with regard to these battles and conflicts and, and the like. And so we focused in on uh, Canaan uh, in God's Word and had a question this morning. You didn't finish showing us where his 11 sons were. Uh, so in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 10, if you'll note, verse number 15, Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And as you read on, it says the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, the Archite, the Sinai, the uh, Arvidite, and the Zemorite, and the Hamathite. And we could add, as Joe did, but I'll, I'll not say that, um, the cellulite. We don't, we don't know where they went. They probably can be found somewhere. And afterwards, there were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. So the, uh, the Canaanites uh, were there, and if you'll count them, counting from Canaan onward, <laughs> what? Did, what? <laughs> Actually, it dawned on me as I said that, but I was afraid to say anything. <laughs> I, thought, I have now entered a no, a no trespassing zone, but that's okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Now, so if you count those from Canaan on, you'll find 11. And though it doesn't have sons, that's what the inference is. And I did uh, some checking in uh, the resources that I have, and I believe that I have some of the best with regard to history and the like. And most of them say this has to do with uh, the sons, though they don't mention them uh, uh, by name like they do um, Sidon and Heth, uh, that each of these sites uh, started with one of the sons of Canaan, and there are 11 of them. So he had 11 sons. Uh, and also, if you turn to Genesis chapter uh, 25, Genesis chapter 25. And starting with verse number 12. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, uh, Sarah's handmaid, bare to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael. And so those particular names are given as well. And just as God promised, he had, last part of verse uh, 16, 12 princes according to their nations. So that brings us up to uh, this particular study here. So uh, the names of the sons of these men are given. And all of these sons had families. And from these families came uh, nations or tribes or groups. And these various ones were all opposed to um, uh, the nation of Israel. And as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul uses it, this particular one that we have on uh, the overhead now, as an example of those who are of the flesh generally that they are going to persecute those of us that are of the Spirit. If we want to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and exalt Him, we're exalting uh, um, uh, the line of Shem. Uh, and so that's a, 
That's something that we need to, to come to understand, that they're not going to like that simply because they don't want to dwell in the tents of Shem. They don't want to come under his authority. They don't want to listen to his God, uh, his word, uh, or what have you. As a matter of fact, this we'll bring in Japheth here. Uh, we're coming into Christmas, all right? Christmas is about what line or seed in the Bible? That of Shem. But whose image do we actually have, uh, and from what line is he? Japheth, that's, that's right. And that's uh, uh, St. Nicholas comes from the line of Japheth. It is taking the emphasis off the line of Shem and putting it on another line or, or seed in the Bible. Okay, turn with me. We're here in chapter 25. Let's go to the next one. We've got two slides to go. And verse number 19. These are the generations of Isaac. Now we already showed you that Rebekah is a Semite. So there's no problem there. But what we have to understand is that God uh, is going to choose even from Rebekah through this line, one to be blessed and one to be cursed. Just like in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Abraham had two sons, but it was one son and one line, one seed in particular. The very same thing with, uh, with uh, Jacob. If you will, hold your place here and come back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 9. And verse number 10, we're going to get what might be called a predestination principle here. Now, we are not talking about God choosing some to be saved and some to be lost. We're talking about God choosing a line uh, in whom all would be blessed if they would recognize this. And here's the principle that he's going to use. Verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. So this is his predestination or elective principle, not of works, but of him that calls. And here is that principle. The elder shall serve the younger. So let's ask um, the question here with regard to uh, Seth and, and, uh, and, um, and Ham. Who is the elder? Ham. Remember, it's Japheth, Ham, it's then uh, Seth, rather, excuse me. Sh Shem. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it. I will get my act together if it kills me. And it may kill me. Uh, speaking of that, I told you I'd tell you a joke. Maybe I'll do that here and do a little soft shoe and a shuffle. They were digging in Germany, and they came down, and uh, there was a, a casket there. And they opened it up, and it was Beethoven, Ludwig von Beethoven. And so they just brought him up, and uh, they put him in a museum, put him on display, and all of a sudden, at dusk, he rose up, and uh, as he, he was laying there with a with a a score of his music and a, and a pencil, the writing implement that they had. He rose up at dusk and he would just scratch through one time the score and lay back down. And the next day, at the very same time, right at dusk, one time a day, uh, right as soon as dusk fell, he would sit up in his casket and scratch through one of the, the uh, pieces of the score of music and lay back down. When, couldn't figure out, what's this guy doing? You know, uh, we all like him, but this is a little weird. Here he is dead, but he raises up and he scratches through one piece of his music and lays back down and so forth. So they called the experts together and they watched him for a, a month and two months doing this very same thing each and every day. At dusk, he would sit up, he would take his music, and he would scratch uh, uh, through it, and he would lay back down. And finally, it dawned on them what he was doing. So they called a news conference together and said, we know why Ludwig von Beethoven every day at dusk raises up and scratches one scratch uh, um, 
uh, in his music and lays back down. He is slowly decomposing. Okay. <laughs> it's the best I can do. We will give refunds at the door. Okay. Um, so, back to the elder and the younger. In order for the Hamites, who are older, to be saved, who do they have to serve? The Semites, the younger. Uh, and it's the same thing with Ishmael and Isaac. Who was the firstborn? Ishmael. But who does Ishmael have to honor if he's going to get saved? Isaac. And now it's going to be the very same principle with Esau and Jacob. Esau's the firstborn. And yet the older is going to have to pay deference to the younger and serve him if they're going to get saved. And that's God's elective principle. And it's the very same thing now with Adam and Lucifer and Christ. Yes, Christ as God uh, was older than Lucifer. But remember that Christ entered as a man and Lucifer as a creature is older than Christ. But what are the angels going to have to do now uh, in order to have uh, eternal life on the other side of eternity future? That is, they're going to have to honor this man, Jesus Christ, who is their younger. Adam is the older. But if the sons of Adam want to get saved, who do they have to serve? The younger Jesus Christ of the, of the two Adams. And so that's God's elective principle. And, and that's why we focus so much in on this line and, and, uh, and honoring uh, the line that God has chosen. Okay, so here we are with Isaac and Re Rebekah. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah. Now, Rebekah was having problems conceiving. So Isaac uh, prayed, and verse number 21, Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. Uh-oh. Here you have two brothers going to give you a little indication of problems ahead. Not only are they going to struggle outside the womb, they begin their conflict inside the womb elbowing, kicking, give me my space, you see. Uh, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said, two nations are in your womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from your bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other. And here's the principle. The elder shall serve the younger. This is um, chapter 25, verse number 23 in Genesis. So, when her days were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in the womb. The first came out red, yeah, like a hairy garment. His name was Esau. After that, the brother came out. But note what happened here. It says that when he came out, his hand took hold on Esau's heel. Now, anytime you start dealing with the heel of the anatomy in this particular uh, uh, way, you're talking about somebody tripping the other up. Uh, focusing on an Achilles heel, a vulnerable spot. And Jacob is going to trip up Esau. And the reason being, uh, in the course of things, Jacob is going to come to love God. Esau is going to come to despise God. And Jacob's going to see an opportunity here, and he's going to exploit it and capitalize on it so that he gets both the blessing of Isaac and the birthright of Esau. So, uh, you go on down here and uh, it says, Esau was a cunning hunter, uh, a man of the field. Uh, Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, uh, for I'm faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Now, immediately we're going to see a contrast here. Because uh, uh, Esau had his name Esau, which meant red. But at this particular point, they're also going to give him a name change. Edom, uh, the, the father of the red race, uh, the, the, uh, the founder of it, uh, if you would. He is going to be the father of the Edomites. And there's a name change there. By the way, we're with Jacob and what happens to Jacob just shortly in history. He has a name change as well, you see. 
so he's going to be called then Israel, Prince with God, and uh, from him are going to come the Israelites. So let's let's look. His name is called Edom, verse 31. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. Now, you know, I've been hungry a time or two in my life. Uh, but I would never sell my, my spiritual birthright. I mean, it's, uh, if I die, I die and I'll enter eternity. But uh, this guy, Esau, is called a profane person. Yes, he was this great hunter. Yes, he was this great son for Isaac. But he hated spiritual things. Uh, and therefore, uh, the Bible always looks at uh, Esau with jaundiced eyes. Uh, and Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die. I've, I've been that way and hungry that, that much. What, shall, what profit shall this birthright be to me? Jacob said, Okay, swear to me this day. And he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. So Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils or beans. By the way, that's one of the answers. I gave the wrong scripture reference. Uh, Miss Lori, thank you for pointing that out, that I am not perfect. But anyway, no, a pottage of lentils, and he did eat. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, it's, it's, knowing, it's knowing this. It's knowing this that God said, Esau have I hated. Why? Because looking down the corridors of time, he knew that Esau would exercise his volition against God and spiritual things. He despised his birthright, even though Esau at this point was a grown man and knew the Semitic blessing. He knew about Abraham, his, his grandfather. He knew about Isaac and how God had dealt with him, his father. And yet he rejected it all for a bowl of beans. Now, that's that's what spiritual things meant to him. He's going to eat it. Another couple of hours, he's going to be hungry again. Uh, and yet his birthright is going to be forever. All right, so let's move from this point then to chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse number 1. It came to pass when Isaac was old. His eyes were dim so that he could not see. He called Esau his eldest son and said, My son... Said unto him, Here am I. I'm now old. I don't know the day of my death. It's going to be soon. Take your weapons and your quiver. Go to the field. Get some venison. Make me some savory uh, meat that I might bless thee before I die. But Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field. And Rebekah spoke to Jacob and said, I heard your father speaking to Esau. Bring me some venison and, and so forth. And so she said to her son, I want you to go to the flock. Get me some meat. Bring it. I'll make this savory meat for your father and I'll fool him. He will not know the difference between what Esau makes and what I make. And I'm going to dress you up for Halloween. And that is, I'm going to make you like Esau. I'm going to put hair on you. I'm going to put a sheepskin on you. You're going to a goat skin rather. And you're going to smell like a man of the field. And you're going to go in there and you're going to demand that your father bless you. And that's exactly what happened. So under verse number 26, his father Isaac said unto him, come near now and kiss me, my son. He came near and kissed him. He smelled the smell of his raiment, blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of the field, which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God, give thee the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth and, and corn and so forth. And note the last part of verse or all of verse 29. Let people serve you. Nations bow down to you. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed is everyone that curses thee and blessed is everyone that blesses thee. Jacob fooled Esau. As a matter of fact, there's a verse that says uh, it, uh, it smells like Esau, uh, feels like Esau, but it's the voice of Jacob. But remember, his eyes were, were dim. He couldn't see. Uh, and so Jacob got the blessing. So now the birthright is gone from Esau and the, the law of primogenitor means the firstborn gets the blessing. But Jacob took that as well. Let's read on verse 30. 
It came to pass as soon as Isaac made an end of blessing Jacob, Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, Esau his brother came in from hunting, and he also made savory meat, and so forth. And Isaac his father said to him, verse 32, Who are you? And he said, I'm your firstborn son. And Isaac trembled because he had given the blessing to, uh, to, to Jacob. And uh, on down, uh, it, it says, um, in verse number uh, 40, this is what's going to happen. Telling Esau, and by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. Oh, okay. Now here's the switcheroo. If Esau is going to have any blessing at all, it's going to be as a result of, of, of uh, bowing down to the one who got the birthright, the honor, the blessing, the power, the authority, uh, and so forth. But note verse 41. And this is what's going on over there right now. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And so they uh, ended up uh, burying Isaac later on when he died. And uh, that, uh, that, now except for, if you'll turn with me to chapter 32. Chapter number 32, and starting with verse number 23. And he took them, meaning Jacob's family, and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. In other words, his possessions. And Jacob was left alone, and he wrestled with the man until the break of day. And he saw that he prevailed not against him. He touched, uh, this is the man, or actually it was an angel, or a theophanic form of Jesus Christ. He touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. As he wrestled with him, let me go, for the day breaks. And he said, I will not accept you, bless me. So there's going to be another blessing upon Jacob. He got the birthright and the blessing from Isaac, but he's going to get a third blessing from this angel. And the blessing is going to be the name change. No, thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So, as we're following the lines, we see that God is rejecting the older one, choosing the younger one. But if the older one wants to be blessed, they have to serve or bow down to the younger line. Now, just a couple of more things here while we're in Genesis chapter 36. In chapter 36, we have Edom and his sons and his wives. Edom is going to have five sons. Now remember, Edom and Esau are the same. But Edom was the name given to him after he sold his birthright. It is a term of derision. And the Edomites and the, uh, the Israelites are going to hate one another. No, it's nearly Christmas. Let's talk about Christmas again and bring this to bear. The Edomites were, uh, with regard to district, were broken into two groups. Edomites on the east, the Edomians, same family, but a name change in the west of where they lived there uh, in south uh, Canaan. From the Edomians, or this Edomite branch, came a fellow that you are familiar with, Herod the Great. Now, to whom did the wise men go first and say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod the Great. But the problem was, who had the title king of the Jews at that time? Herod the Great. So Herod scratched his head. Why is it wrong for Herod the Great to be called the king of the Jews? He was an... Edomian. He was an Edomite. And immediately, what did he try to do to baby Jesus? Kill him. 
And as a matter of fact, he killed quite a few Jewish babies from two years old and under trying to get to Christ. But uh, Mary and Joseph with the child fled to, to Egypt. Uh, so that's how it, it automatically history begins to, uh, to, to make sense now. Why did he hate this child so much? He was an Edomite. He wanted that land. He wanted that title. He wanted to govern the Jews, you see. But he wasn't a Jew. He was from Esau, the cursed line. Uh, and of course, uh, unbelief uh, is demonstrated in the fact that he wanted to kill the child. All right. These are the generations of Esau, verse 1, Genesis 36, who is Edom. Esau took wives of the daughters of Canaan. Now, let me ask you a question. What wasn't the line of Shem to do? Take no wife from the Hamitic line, let alone the Canaanites. Esau said, I'm going to spite my father and my brother. I'm going to go. And he took two of them. But not only that, it says, you'll, you'll come on down, verse 3, and Beshemath, Ishmael's daughter. So he had three he had five sons from three wives. Two of them were Canaanites. One of them was an Ishmaelite. Is it no wonder the line uh, of Esau hates the Jews? It's, all these genetics are built up because one line hates the other, and they're going to fight them to the death uh, with regard to this. Uh, now let's um, let's look at uh, the book of. Let's look at the book of Numbers, chapter 20. Numbers, chapter 20. Now, in Numbers, chapter 20, we have another example of Edomite hatred. And we'll start reading with verse number 14. Now, let me give you the historical setting. It is the Israelites had just come up out of Egypt. It was, uh, it was about um, uh, a year. And they got the tabernacle and they began marching toward the promised land. On the way to the promised land, the Edomites had already settled into south Canaan. Uh, and so uh, the Canaanites were, were north, took that territory, and here were the uh, Edomites on the one side. Moses sent messages from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel. Now note that. Uh, but it's going to show here the animosity between the, the, fa the family members and these brothers and their line and descendants. It's, it's your brother. It's your long lost brother. We've been down in Egypt, you know all about it, and we're coming to the promised land to get our blessings. Now, why didn't the Edomites like that? Because they think that the, uh, uh, the Israelites stole the blessing. Remember what Jacob did? He tripped up Esau. He grabbed him by the heel, he, uh, threw him a curve. Uh, he tripped him up, and he got the blessing. He got the birthright, and he got a third blessing from God him, himself through the uh, theophanic uh, appearance of Christ. You know how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we have dwelled in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. We cried to the Lord. They would have known about the Lord, but the Edomites rejected Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and uh, uh, Jacob. And he heard our voice and sent an angel and delivered us. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country, and we will not pass through thy fields or vineyards, will not, uh, or, uh, neither will we drink the water of your wells. We'll go by the king's highway and not turn to the left or the right till we have passed your borders. In other words, we don't want to cause you any problem. Your family members, uh, we understand there's animosity, but you should at least let us pass through. Note what the Edomites did. Edom said unto him, you'll not pass by me. You're not going to get your eternal blessings and inheritance, lest I come out against you with a sword. The children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of your water, we'll pay for it. 
I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. In other words, we're not going to trample your crops. We're, we're not going to crowd your space. We'll go on the highway that's already cut out in, in the wilderness. Just let us through because we're going to have to go the long way around and there's no bypass. But it says, uh, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him. They, they didn't fight at that point, though they did fight at other uh, points. All right. Now let's go back to chapter 27 in Genesis. And look at the wife for Jacob. What did she have to be? Or, excuse me, what did they have to be? They had to be Semites as well. Now you remember this, that Ishmael took an Egyptian wife, Esau took a, a Canaanite wife and an Ishmaelite wife. So all of his descendants are full of the cursed uh, genes. What about Jacob? Well, as Abraham had to take a Semite, as Isaac had to take a Semite, Jacob had to take a Semite. And he did, four of them. Verse number, uh, we're in chapter 27 here, let's go to verse number 46. Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. Now, the daughters of Heth evidently were, um, were excuse the phrase, you know, good looking babes. And they're always a temptation for, for uh, Jacob. Now, who were the daughters of Heth? Have we heard this name before? Hold your place. Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 9. And Canaan begat Sidon his firstborn. As, uh, excuse me, it's chapter 10, not the first 9, verse 15. Excuse me. And Canaan begat Sidon his firstborn. And who? Heth. Heth was a Canaanite. The Canaanites were, were in the land. And she said, they're wearying me because they're making passes at, at uh, Jacob. You know, and, and uh, he's going to end up wanting to marry one of them or get them in trouble and what have you. Uh, such as these, which are the, the daughters of the land, meaning they were Canaanites. What good shall my life do to me? So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Have we heard this before? Remember, Eliezer put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, and Abraham said, Do not take a wife out of the daughters of Canaan for Isaac. You go back to my land. And that's just exactly what Isaac is going to do to Jacob. Don't take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Go to Pandemaram, the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, my, uh, thy mother's brother. So he went away, and that's exactly what he did. He went back to Uncle Laban, and uh, he is going to, uh, at this point, get a wife. Now let's go to chapter uh, 29, and we'll read about this. We're, we're almost out of time. We're probably going to have a part four uh, of this, and just because we're run out of time here. As you're turning to chapter 29, verse number 15, I... It, it's, it's okay that we do this because um, it is difficult getting all of these names together and getting the contrast, but we're going to get it. Laban said to Jacob, because thou art my brother, literally a, a family member, shouldest thou therefore serve me for nothing? In other words, Jacob came up to Uncle Laban and said, Uncle Laban, I want to I wanna work for you. Oh, no, says Uncle Laban. Um, well, I want to give you some compensation. What can I, uh, what will your wages be? Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed. Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. 
Uh, that's the King James uh, um, prudishness here. You understand what well favored is. We would say today she was well endowed. She was the, the, the prettier of the two, though Leah was not uh, uh, any slouch, as it were. But Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Uh, and as uh, Brian Mabry said this morning, uh, remember Laban, <laughs> Laban is from the, the Jewish line there. He's from a, he's a Shemite and he, he knows how to give a, a bargain and how to get a bargain here. Laban says, uh, it's better that I should give her thee than that I should give her to a, another man. Serve uh, me and abide with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed unto him, but a few days for the love he had to her. Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I might go into her. So Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Going to have a, a wedding. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, his, his first daughter, brought her to him, and he went into her. <laughs> Jacob, in a minute here, he's going to remove the veil. <laughs> uh, and he's going to realize that he did not get what he bargained originally for. Laban, uh, excuse me, uh, verse number 23, and brought her in, he went into her. And Laban gave unto his daughter uh, Leah, Zilpah, his handmaid, um, his maid, foreign handmaid. Now, if you look down here at verse number 9 in chapter 30, and you'll see the significance of this. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her, a Jacob, to wife. And she also then bore some of the um, uh, children of Israel. And if you'll come on up to verse number three, this is Rachel. Rachel said, Behold, my maid Bilhah, go into her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I might also have children by her. They're in competition now. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in to her. Anyway, let's go back to, to chapter 29 here. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah, and he said to, to Laban, what is this that you've done to me? Did I not serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then as you beguiled me? It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Seven years later, he's telling him this. Seven years he worked and time flew by. He just wanted Rachel so badly. But all of a sudden, he gets up uh, uh, after the, the honeymoon. Why he didn't know it was Leah the night before, I don't know. But it says he got up in the morning and behold, uh, it's Leah, it's not Rachel. What are you doing, Uncle Laban? So Laban said, fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service. So he served another seven years. Anyway, from these four women, Leah, Rachel, Zilhah, and Bilhah, came the 12 sons of Israel, and they are called 12 tribes. Turn to chapter 49 and verse 28 where it says, all these, and it's a, it's a reference starting from Reuben all the way down to Benjamin. Reuben was the, the firstborn from Leah all the way down to Benjamin, who was the lastborn from Rachel. It says, all these, as it listed the 12 sons, are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is that that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. Okay, we're it, it, coming up on uh, 8 o'clock, but I want to at least show you the next uh, slide and uh, what we're going to be discussing. The last one has to do with Lot. Because two family members, and by the way, Abraham was Lot's uncle. And uh, Lot, of course, was his nephew. And there is an incestuous relationship with Lot and his two daughters. Uh, and by the way, Lot separated from Abraham before Abraham caught the covenant of circumcision. So Lot was still uncircumcised. 
at this uh, at this particular time. And Lot had a relationship with his two daughters that ended up with two sons that gave two different tribes, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And we'll study about them later. 